Today's November 14th, 2016. We're at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, my name is Joe Bruckner. I'm a volunteer at the History Center, and with me is Tony Hilliard, who's also a volunteer at the History Center. We're honored to have with us today Mr. Oliver Har Harley. Holly, I'm sorry. Uh, Halley, that's all right. Halley. And he is a veteran of the United States Navy and was a participant in the war in Vietnam and has kindly agreed to come and talk to us about his experiences, both his experiences in life and his experiences particularly in the Navy and also so particularly in, in Vietnam. Uh, this is part of the Library of Congress Veterans History Project and Mr. Holly's story will be put on file at the Atlanta History Center as well as the Library of Congress and we're very honored to have you here today and thank you for participating. Well, I'm honored to be here to be honest okay. with you. Thank you. Uh, could you give us your full name and the city and state where you currently live? Uh, Oliver Grant Halley. I was born in Delhi, New York and uh, I live now in Marietta, Georgia. Okay. What is your birth date? February 17th, 1946. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Okay. Uh, I grew up in a small family. My mother and father were only ch children, so I had no aunts, no uncles, no cousins. And I had two brothers. My older brother, who died in 2009, he was two years older, and my younger brother, who's uh, almost two years younger than I am, he still lives in New York. Um, my father and his family emigrated from Nazi Germany in 1935 or so. And my mother was born in Brooklyn, but her father was born and raised in Germany and came here as a young man. And my mother's mother was born in Brooklyn as well. And we moved to Brooklyn when I was a baby, so I have no memory of where I was born whatsoever. My first memories begin in Brooklyn, and then we moved to Staten Island when I was seven, and that's where I uh, grew up, uh, too. My father and mother built a legend around our family. Uh, again, I knew that my father and his family had moved from, uh, emigrated from Nazi Germany, but uh, they built a legend around that. And the legend had to do with that uh, his father, my grandfather, who I didn't know, he was killed in a car accident in 1939, I did know that. And he was a prominent surgeon in New York. And the legend was that they resisted the Third Reich. My father was an under, in an underground movement, and um, it was all very romantic. And that was the story that uh, I grew up with. But I had no aunts, no uncles, no cousins, nobody that I knew. I never met my grandfather, never met my grandmother. The only relative I ever knew was my mother's father, my, my maternal grandfather, and he died when I was eight in 1954. Was and he in the States or did, was he still in Georgia? He was here. He actually lived with us. Uh, he was an educator in New York City. Uh, but that's the only relative I knew outside of my parents. And I'm going to get more later as we get into this interview. There's um, much more to this that pertains to Vietnam. Okay. Good. What were the circumstances under which you went into the military? Uh, when I was growing up, um, everybody went in the military. That was just the way it was. A lot of people don't know that the draft began in June of 1940, and it didn't end until, I think, roughly 1975. So even during the peacetime between the Korean War and Vietnam, uh, people were being drafted. In my high school, you know, people either volunteered or went into the military, and it was acceptable. Nobody even thought about avoiding it. If they, got, if they didn't want to join, um, they were drafted and they didn't complain. That's just the way it was. And I grew up in that environment at uh, post-World War II. Mm -hmm. You see a lot of veterans from World War II. During parades, it was always a big deal. And it was, a, it's just what you did. That, it was your turn to step mm -hmm. up when it came time. So there was never any doubt in my mind I would go into service. And growing up in New York and seeing the ships in New York Harbor, and, um, I was attracted to the Navy. It just, yeah. it was just, there was never any doubt that's where I wanted to go. Yeah. So you enlisted? I 
it, I was enlisted in reserves briefly. I applied for an officer program, and it was called uh, ROC, uh, ROC slash OCS, where you did OCS at Newport, Rhode Island in two different summers. So I went through OCS, okay. two nine-week um, periods, first one in the summer of 1966, uh, June 18th, 1966, to August 17th, 1966, and then I went back in, I think it was probably August 17th or 18th, 1967, and was commissioned on October 20th, 1967. Okay. Tell us about your military career, just uh, your training, where you were, where you were assigned, what you did. Um, Officer training, Officer Candidate School was at Newport, Rhode Island, and uh, it was uh, very academic, military too, but very academic. A lot of courses, they crammed a lot of information into you in a short period of time. After OCS, I was uh, assigned briefly to um, Brunswick, Georgia, the Naval Air Station there at a CIC school, that's Combat Information Center. And then from there, I went to the USS Springfield which was the flagship of the Second Fleet in Norfolk. And I reported on board the Springfield on January 5th, 1968. I was on the Springfield from January of 68 until I think it was roughly uh, June 20th, roughly 1969. In the Springfield, I was the uh, Operations uh, Electronics, OE, division officer. We had, I think, 41 enlisted people, and there was a chief warrant officer who also, and a chief petty officer. It was a big division, big responsibility to maintain the radar uh, equipment on board the ship. And again, we were the flagship for the second fleet, so we carried an admiral and his staff plus the ship's company. Probably uh, the Springfield ranks as one of the most shaping one of the most shaping experiences of my entire life. We had an executive officer named Warren C. Ham. He was a commander. And I was 22 years old when I reported on board the, uh, I was, uh, yeah, 22, I think, when I reported on the Springfield, yeah. And uh, Commander Ham was about as close as you could come to a Captain Bly. I mean, I, hmm. You know, everybody was just like, wow, th this guy is as tough as nails. And his expectations were so high. I mean, uh, slightest infractions <laughs> could cause you problems, to say the least. And I couldn't wait to get away from this man, as most. On, I, believe me, it wasn't just me. And when I left the Springfield in June of 69, it was because I had orders then for swift boat training in uh, Mare Island, California. But I just want to say briefly what happened with regard to Commander Ham. Years in 1977, I happened to be reading a newspaper, and I saw that Commander Ham was a rear admiral now because uh, President Jimmy Carter named him to replace General John Singlob as the chief negotiator in Korea, Panmunjom, and I had no idea what happened at Commander Ham, and I was like, "Wow, he he made admiral and uh, has this presidential uh, position, a real responsible position." So I was somewhat impressed. But as the years went by in my career, and we'll talk more about that later, um, I began to realize that Admiral Ham had it right. This guy really understood leadership. And I was just too young to know that I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And he had a real profound effect on my life in the sense that I, I began to understand what real leadership was. Now, he wasn't the only great leader I met, but he was certainly one of the most um, important in my life. In 2003, I made an effort to try and find him. I didn't even know if he was alive, and I did find him. He was living in St. Albans, Vermont. Uh, he had retired from the Navy in 1987, and I reached out to him. I wrote him a letter, told him what a profound effect he had on my life, that I realized as time went by, he had it right and, and I had it wrong, 
and that I learned so much from him throughout the rest of my uh, career in life. So you built a relationship with him? I did, and then he invited me to come up, and my wife and I went up in February of 2007, and we spent uh, four or five days at his home. And I have a speaking program in addition to another business now, and he had me speak to um, a couple of groups up there in St. Albans, Vermont. And he was still the same old tough admiral at this point in his early 80s at that point. I think he's close to 90 now. And uh, it was a delightful visit. Um, he told me to call him Warren, and I said, there's not a chance in, in, in a million years I could call you Warren. You're, you're admiral. Yeah. And, uh, and I still call him admiral, and we still communicate. That's we great. still communicate uh, by email, uh, same tough guy. Uh, the kind of guy, if you're going to war, that's who you want to go with. Well, that had to mean a lot to him, to hear from somebody that was in your position at the time. And, he and told me it did mean a lot, and one of my very close friends from the Springfield, who I also went to uh, Vietnam with on swift boats, a fellow officer, he, uh, he just went up there in late August to see Admiral Hamm for the first time, too, as a result of my visit. Finally, after all these years, he went up there, too. So, yeah, I think Admiral Hamm really appreciates yeah. this. He knew he was a tough guy. He knew he wasn't loved, uh, but he was respected. Yeah. And I'd rather have the respect than the love, yes. right? Yeah. And you're a military guy. You yeah. can appreciate that. Yeah. So when you went to swift boat training, where was that? Uh, they had just moved it from San Diego to Mare Island, uh, California, which was, um, in, you know, a base um, in Vallejo, California, 27 miles north of San Francisco. They had just moved it. I, I was a second class. My friend, Kenny, the one I just mentioned who visited Admiral Ham, <coughs> he was in the first class that had moved up from uh, San Diego. So it was 11 weeks of training at uh, Mare Island with one week, though, at Whidbey Island, Washington for survival school. Okay. And then we did, I think we did another week at a Camp Roberts, an Army base, uh, for uh, day and nighttime um, firearms and weapons training. Did you volunteer for Swift Boat? I did. Uh, did you? Interestingly enough, I'd never even heard of a Swift Boat. And when I was on the Springfield, the trend was that every officer had two tours of duty to do in three years and that most of the officers were rotating to Vietnam on their second tour. So <clears throat> my friend Kenny, the same guy, I don't, I don't remember where, but somewhere he heard about swift boats and I said, what's a swift boat? <laughs> and he described it as best he could and I uh, said, I'm going to volunteer for that. I said, well, you know what, I'll volunteer with you. And uh, we figured, you know, hey, if we're going to Vietnam, might as well do something that, you know, yeah. is meaningful. Yeah. So we volunteered for swift boats, and it took the endorsement of the commanding officer. And the commanding officer at the time was uh, Captain Lando Zeck. He retired as uh, a vice admiral and chief of naval personnel. Tremendous human being. Another guy, different style of leadership than Admiral Ham, but just... Uh, a, a guy that I had the utmost respect for. I, the things that I saw him do in the Springfield. Um, so these are leadership things that I took with me for the rest of my life between Admiral Ham, Zach, and then some other officers. I could go on and on, but you know. Um, so that's how it happened that I volunteered for Swift Boats. Okay. Talk about that training and what that involved. Uh, the training was. Uh, uh, you know, every day I lived in an apartment off the base with three other guys. One of them was this guy, Kenny, and uh, the other two were on PBRs, Patrol Boat River. They were the 33-foot fiberglass boats, so they were training separately on the same base. And the training, you know, began early in the morning. Um, a lot of classroom training, communications, seamanship, uh, the engineering of the boat. Um, it, it was not rigorous training. Not, it wasn't anything like OCS and some of the other schools I went to. I think they pretty much, you know, they, it was more of a familiarization. And uh, the last week of swift boat training uh, was a week where we did day and nighttime patrolling and they simulated um, firefights. Mm -hmm. They had ambushes set up for us and, and, you know, and 
you know, try to train you on how to react, what to yeah. do, you know. And the boat, a lot of people don't know this, but on the boat we had twin 50 caliber machine guns up forward in what we call a gun tub. And then back aft we had a 50 caliber machine gun mounted over an 81 millimeter mortar. And the 81 millimeter mortar could be fired like a rifle, literally, it had a trigger. And, uh, <coughs> and then of course indirect fire. Um, so we, we trained on all of that uh, over the 11 week period. And then in September, I know we arrived in Vietnam on September 27th, uh, 1969. Um, I, you know, with the international change in time, I yeah. guess we left. I'm not sure the day. We, we might have left on the 26th because we left out of Tacoma Air Force Base in Washington. I remember that. And then we took the flight and it stopped in Anchorage. And... I think it made one other stop, might have been in Okinawa, and then we landed in Vietnam. What was your first impression when you got off the plane? What do you remember? The thing that I remember best, that instant of leaving the plane, instant was two things that happened exactly the same time. They just converged. The heat and the stench both hit you in the face at the same time. It was like, whoa, I mean, just overpowering. The heat and the stench. And when we got off the plane, you see all these sandbags, and we landed in Cameron Bay. Oh, okay. Cameron Bay was one of the uh, swift boat bases, and it was the headquarters for Coastal Squadron 1. And then from there, we were going to be farmed out to one of five coastal divisions. And um, I remember seeing the sandbags and seeing, you know, you, you say, wow, we, we are definitely in a war zone when you saw that and you saw everybody in fatigues and you, you had Army there and Navy and Air Force and you say, whoa, man, this is the real deal. Mm -hmm. So that was my impression. <laughs> well, starting from that first day, talk about your experiences in Vietnam. From, I think it was in Cameron Bay, uh, two or three days and I was sent to Coastal Division 12 in Da Nang and I remember uh, getting up to Da Nang and uh, they didn't have transportation for us to get from the airport uh, in Da Nang to the base and I was I remember I was a little put out by that and we had some staff officers who seemed to be indifferent about it so yeah. for me that didn't set a good tone uh, but anyway, we somehow got a, somebody came in a truck finally and picked us up and took us to the base. And I had a roommate in the uh, BOQ, Bachelor Officers Quarters, nice guy, a guy named Sonny Barber. And Sonny had been in one hellacious firefight. And I remember, you know, you knew and so you're scared. You're already thinking, you know, what am I in for? And here, here was Sonny and few others, uh, they had been ambushed on the Kuadaya River, one of the rivers that our swift boat would be um, patrolling. And they were ambushed. They were hit with a B-40 rocket. Sonny was knocked over the side, and he swam to shore. And I um, still remember telling the story. The Viet Cong were looking for him. They, they had seen him. They had seen him swimming. And they came looking for him, and he's hiding under the water and the reeds. And he was there all night until the next day when a Vietnamese junk, I think they call them Yabudas, came by. And, and they were going to take him under fire, if I remember correctly. I mean, it's a long time ago, but somehow he was able to, like, you know, American, and um, they rescued him. But, you know, it was a terrifying incident. You can imagine, you know, you can hear the Viet Cong all around you as yeah. they're looking for the guy yeah. that they saw swim yeah. over there. Wow. So that was my introduction to what uh, I could, you know, maybe face in the yeah. year to come. We began coastal patrols. Uh, when I got there, I was doing coastal patrols at first. And the thing that uh, I've told a lot of people is more terrifying so many times than going into the rivers was coastal patrol. Not because you were going to be shot at, but because of the weather. And right after I got to Da Nang, we uh, got into the monsoon season and it rained and rained and rained. I've never seen rain like that in my life. 
and the seas were high. A lot of times we couldn't get out of Denying Harbor. The seas were just too high. Um, and you, you're always afraid of, you know, the weather. The, you could lose your boat. And in fact, uh, before I got to Vietnam, several swift boats were lost in, uh, off the coast uh, north of uh, Da Nang in some operation, and mm -hmm. I think some people drowned. Again, that preceded my time, yeah. but everybody knew the story. Yeah. And these boats had a pretty high top sail, so they, you know, they weren't designed for that kind of weather. Yeah. So that was always scary. And then, um, then we began uh, doing the riverine operations in the Kodai River. And I was in Da Nang for, I think, a month, and they assigned me to go to Chulai, south of Da Nang, and Chulai was part of the uh, Coastal Squadron 12. Chulai was the best duty I had in, while I was in Vietnam. That was nice. Uh, had a hooch that I shared with another officer, had a Vietnamese woman who cleaned our hooch out every day. Uh, it, it was good. We did nothing but coastal patrols. And, um, you know, so there was no real risk of getting killed. But what put a real damper on it was one day the word came down that some boats had been in a firefight up in Da Nang in the Kudai River. And one of the officers, uh, I had met him only one time uh, when I got to Vietnam. I met him one time, uh, Ken Norton. And Ken Norton was uh, one of two boats that came under fire, and, and he took an AK round. It went through his vest. Apparently, it caught him on the side where there was a little opening, and it killed him. Mm. So that was my uh, that was uh, that that put a real damper on on things. And and I forgot to mention something really important. I I'm surprised I forgot it. You asked earlier about first day in the division. The very day I got to Cameron Bay when we landed, the very day, um, there was a tragic occurrence in Da Nang where I was going. And what had happened was one of the boats had returned from an operation and uh, there weren't enough boats for uh, every crew. So they would rotate, you know, this crew had it, then the next crew had it. But you were, the returning crew was responsible for cleaning up the boat, making sure it was rearmed, that all the mortar box, the mortar box was full, all the ammunition, everything was full, and that the uh, machine guns and all other weapons um, were, um, you know, you didn't have any uh, rounds in them. Well, on this day, the first day in Vietnam, while I'm in Cameron Bay, a teletype came down that there had been an accident. And what had happened was the crew um, coming in, they had turned over the boat to another crew. Well, the crew coming in had been skippered by uh, Elmo Zumwalt, Admiral Zumwalt's son. And I had known Elmo, not well. I had met him stateside uh, when I was on the Springfield. He was friends with a guy in the Springfield there. And, and if I forget, remind me to talk more about Elmo later, okay, okay if, you, if yeah. I forget. I hadn't thought about this until now. Anyway, uh, what had happened was the boat came in. So the class ahead of me, the swift boat class ahead of me, my friend Kenny, there were two officers, uh, three officers in that class. I was one of two in my class. Anyway, Another officer, not my friend Kenny, but one of his classmates, John Hakey, he was getting ready to take that boat out. And the, there was an experienced officer who was breaking in John Hakey, Hakey's, Hakey or Hakey's crew, breaking them in. And he was standing on the mortar box and he was explaining, you know, this is this or whatever he was uh, trying to get across. And the machine gun back aft was pointed, you know, it point, point, always pointed back aft. And the mortar box was behind the barrel. And this officer, I know his name, and I'm just drawing a blank, I never met him. And he was standing on the box just so he could look down and everybody could hear him. And the, this uh, gunner's mate uh, was 
getting ready to, you know, I guess clean the machine gun or whatever he was going to do, who knows. And he pulled the operating rod all the way back, slammed it forward, and he pulled the trigger, you know, thinking it was empty, but there was a round in it. There was one round in it, and it caught that officer in the groin. Caught him right in the groin. And again, I was not there, but certainly heard the stories, uh, and I knew John Hagee at the time. John was standing just to the side of the front of the barrel. He caught the, the muzzle blast. His face, when I saw him in Denang, it looked like he had freckles, but it was just bloody, little tiny bloody spots from the muzzle blast. He was that close. And he rammed his knee into the groin of this officer to try and stop the bleeding, uh, but he was dead in, within less than 24 hours, what I, what I understand. Mm. So that was my first day in Vietnam. If you don't think that won't put a damper on oh, things, first yeah. day. And it put a real damper on uh, Elmo Zumwalt. Uh, he transferred out of the division and went down to Coastal Division 11 um, immediately. And there was an investigation. And, you know, nothing that I recall really came out of the investigation. Obviously, there was some negligence there. A gun should have been, yeah. um, shouldn't have been loaded, yeah. Yeah, but it was. Um, I felt very badly for Elmo Zumwalt, and I got to know him better later uh, because Elmo and I ended up going to the University of North Carolina Law School. We were there at the same time. Yeah. He was a class ahead of me because he got out of Vietnam before I did, and uh, Elmo and I talked about a lot of this stuff. He died of cancer in 1988. Mm -hmm. Kind of sad. He and I corresponded toward the end. And um, it was kind of sad. I felt bad for the guy. He was a decent guy. Yeah. Just sometimes things don't fall right. And Elmo just, even in the book, My Father, My Son, which Elmo, the two Zumwalt's wrote. And even in there, he talked about it just seemed to be, have been born with a black cloud hanging over his head. So welcome to Vietnam. That and then a few weeks later, Ken Norton getting killed, and, yeah. and it's like, whoa, it's yeah. going to be a long year. Yeah. So I left. Uh, I was only in July for a month because we closed the uh, base. They were shutting it down, the, the Navy part. Uh, not, uh, at least the Swift part, I should narrow that down. Went back to Da Nang, resumed patrols up there in the Kuodai River on the coast. What, what would you describe as the mission of the Swift boat? Uh, on the coast, it was pretty much uh, the same. You had, uh, it was part of what was called market time, and that was an operation where you had a barrier, three-layer barrier of uh, vessels to interdict um, firearms and contraband coming down from the north. So on the outer perimeter, you had your large warships, I couldn't tell you how many miles they were out. I mean, I'd be guessing if I said 25, 50, or, or 100. I, I don't know, but they were out of sight. They were pretty yeah. far out. Yeah. And then in the middle barrier, you had smaller vessels, the Coast Guard WPBs, even Coast Guard cutters. And then in the inner barrier were, were uh, the swift boats. Uh, you know, when I say inner barrier, probably five to 10 miles out at the most. Okay. And you would stop and search uh, these vessels, these sampans, junks, whatever came down, you know, you, you stopped them, searched them, see if they had anything. I, yeah. I, I never did find a single one that had any contraband. I'll jump ahead just since we're on that topic. Uh, later when I was transferred to, and spent the rest of my time in Vietnam, nine, nine out of 12 months in Coastal Division 11 down in the um, um, southern end of, tip of Vietnam, had an interesting experience. I've told a lot of people this uh, this story because they, you know, when we talk about firearms and talking about police shootings, you know, what goes through your head. This particular night, it was uh, it was late at night, 10, 10, 11, 12 o'clock, I, I don't remember, but it was late. I remember that, it was dark, of course. And there was this sampan and um, seemed to be, you know, drifting by itself. So we came up on the sampan and we had searchlights on the boat and put the lights on the boat to, put, to try and blind the people so that they couldn't see you but you could see them. A safety measure. There was a man, a woman, and several children and just lots of stuff laid out in the sampan. 
I had a Vietnamese sailor on board who was really a good, good crew member. Uh, I wish I knew where he was. Tremendous crew member. So my responsibility was I would check all the papers, their identification, their kankuk, their identification card, look at the papers, and he would give orders to them to lift things up so we could see what was in them. You know, they had canisters and, you know, suitcases, whatever they had, but he would, he would talk to them Vietnamese mm -hmm. to do everything. So I was looking at the documents and I carried, when we did coastal patrol, I carried a revolver. Um, I didn't do that in the river, but on the coastal patrol, I carried a revolver. And you'd have your crew members, one usually had a shotgun, another one, one or two more might have had an M16. And, you know, but these were kind of low-key things. You, you, you weren't tensed up. They, they were so routine, and that's the danger. Anytime, kind of like a police stop, when they become routine, that's when you got a problem. So this particular night, you know, routine, I'm looking at the ID, and all of a sudden, the Vietnamese sailor, he screamed. I heard this blood-curdling scene. He just, yeah! And he does a head-first dive into the pilot house. And this is happening so quickly. And I look over at, his name was On. I look over at On and he had literally jumped into the pilot house screaming. And I look down, and all this is happening quickly. I look down and I see this man, this Vietnamese man, and he's holding what looks like a German Luger. I mean, I, my heart sank. I mean, I'm thinking, oh, I, I, I couldn't get my revolver out fast enough. I, I, I just couldn't get it out fast enough. And, and I'm moving as fast as I can, but it, no matter how fast you're going, it's just not fast enough. And I'm, I'm trying to get it out, and I got it down on him, and I'm ready to pull the hammer, and he screamed. They, this Vietnamese he screamed, and he dropped the gun. Huh. It was a water gun. Oh, God. It was a water gun. It was a black plastic German Luger wow. water gun. I mean, that's the kind of thing that, you know, that could have gotten me killed, and it could have gotten him killed. Yeah. And, you know, but that, that's the kind of thing you faced, yeah. you know? And I told people, you know, as a cop, if you're a cop, and you have to make a quick decision, and you see something like that, you don't have time to figure out if it's a water gun. Yeah. You don't have time. And if he hadn't, if, if, if he had been one second later in dropping that, that gun, that water gun, I mean, I would have pulled the, pulled the trigger. Yeah. And, and I'm so glad it didn't have that ending, yeah. you know what I mean? But wow. that, that's, um, that taught me a lot, yeah. I mean, to this day. So anyway, back up to uh, denying patrols. You had the, you know, interdiction, stopping these vessels. It was pretty boring, to be honest with you. It really wasn't. And, you, you know, the, even if the seas weren't really rough, you're still taking a pounding. Right. You know, these boats, were, they just weren't designed for that. The river patrols, it depended on which, which river you were in as to what the mission was. So they, they were all different. Um, I was in, I was on, uh, while I was in Vietnam, I only uh, was on three different rivers, the Kuadai, the Bode, uh, down in, all the way in the Khao Mau Peninsula, and then the one up at Hat Tien, which is on the uh, Cambodian border, uh, and I don't remember the name of that river. I don't know why, oh. but for some reason I, I don't. I'm good with dates. Maybe you figured that out already. <laughs> yeah, very I, good. I, I have fun with that with people, but... <laughs> I don't remember the name of that particular river at, at Hatien. But in December, um, December 23rd, 1969, uh, we were called in, a number of the officers were at Coastal Division 12 were called in and said that there were five new swift boats being brought in from the United States, brand new. They were the Mark Threes, the latest uh, version and they needed volunteers, they needed five officers and five crews to take them to Coastal Division 13, Cat Low. Now, here's the rest of the story. Coastal Division 12 was going to be shut down within months. That wasn't a rumor, that was a fact. They were shutting down all of the divisions over about a year and a half, maybe, uh, and turning them over to the Vietnamese Navy. 
So we were going to be transferred no matter what, somewhere. And Coast, Coastal Division 11 down in the southern tip of Vietnam, actually the headquarters for Coastal Division 11 was a non-propelled barracks ship and it was anchored alongside a repair ship uh, off the island of Antoy, 40 miles south of the Kamau Peninsula. It was all by itself, 40 miles south. That was our headquarters for Coastal Division 11. That's where all the action was at this point in Vietnam. All the, you know, every, anytime there was some firefight or somebody got wounded or killed, it was coming out of 11. So <laughs> my friend Kenny and I and all the other guys were like, hey, we, we don't need to go to Coastal Division 11. You know, we, we don't need that. Let's volunteer for the, uh, for this since we know they're going to Cat Low, Coastal Division 13. And Cat Low, was next to Vung Tau, and you might remember that. That was an in-country R&R oh, base. Right. So he said, hey, this could be yeah. good duty. Yeah. So we volunteered. Uh, five of us volunteered to take these boats down there and uh, spend the rest of our nine, uh, nine out of 12 months down in Cat Low. So on uh, Christmas Eve day, December the 24th, uh, I think it was a C-130 flew us down to Catlo, and the boats were already there, and we were happy. I mean, this is this is as good as it gets. We we dodged a bullet, not having to go to 11. <clears throat> so we get there, and I remember we were sleeping that night in Catlo in a, some barracks, and I remember the next morning, uh, just I guess it was before the. Um, you know, the truce went into, the Christmas truce went into effect. But it was my first introduction to a B-52 bombing uh, somewhere in the area. I don't know exactly yeah. where, but I mean, it was incredible. I, I couldn't believe how the ground would shake and, you know, and it's like, whoa. I mean, it, you know, I hadn't experienced that in Da Nang. And Da Nang, you know, saw a lot of... Uh, I guess it was the C-130s where they puffed the Magic Dragons. Yeah. Did see them working, yeah. uh, yeah. watch them work at nighttime especially. Pretty impressive yeah. stuff. But that, this was the first B-52 uh, strike. Again, I don't know where it was, but it was somewhere in the area. On Christmas Day, uh, rumors started to fly that these new boats were not going to stay in Cat Low. They were going down to Coastal Division 11, Hantoy. Now, that's that further south. Then. Much further. Yeah. Uh, and I'm like, oh, no, this can't be true. So I went to the ops officer. We were in the officer's club. This is Christmas Day. And he said, hey, there's rumors that um, these, we're not staying here, that the boats are going down to Coastal Division 11. He said, let's talk about it tomorrow. He said, I don't want to you know, ruin anybody's Christmas. We'll have a meeting tomorrow. So on the 26th, he, the ops boss called a meeting, and he said that the boats, the new boats, were going to be going for 30 days on a special coastal patrol um, down to Antoy. And the coastal patrol would be in the Gulf of Thailand, not on the Pacific Ocean side, but on the Gulf of Thailand side. That there, for whatever reason, I, I don't know or remember the operational reason, but they wanted they wanted a coastal patrol there to do basically what we had done up in Da Nang and Chulai and the other divisions. So we're like, okay, well, at least that's probably pretty safe. And I still remember the ops boss, boss's words. He said, I promise to have you back in 30 days. I promise you that. I said, okay, we're good. Well, I was the most senior of the five officers, not by much. <laughs> not by much. When you're a Lieutenant JG, you're not very senior to anybody. But, you know, even if it's one day, you're the guy. Yeah. So I was responsible for bringing the five boats down to, um, transiting down to Antoy. I, I should know, but I don't remember how many miles it was. Um, it was a good. It was a good trip. I, it could have been a hundred miles. It could have been more. Um, now my curiosity's peaked, so I'm going to find out. Yeah. But, but it was a good trip. And you know, we're doing it at night. I think we started during the day. It was about a 24-hour ride. There, I remember that. 
And when at nighttime came, you know, we're using our radar. We had a radar to try and pilot, figure out where we are. But, the, but we hit rough weather. It, it was rough. And it was scary. And then trying to keep track of all the other boats. And, you know, so we were on the radios throughout the night. You know, where are you? You know, and as best we could, track them on radar, too, trying to keep our positions. Hopefully nobody would fall behind, anybody have any problems. And one of the problems, and I, I forgot to mention this, with the other boats, in particular the older boats, it was not uncommon for the exhaust boots, they were rubber, where the exhaust would come out of your engines, and we had two 12V71 Detroit diesel engines. And so where the exhaust would come out, these boots sometimes burned out. And if they burned out, you took on water. And that happened a number of times. It happened to me twice, at least twice. And one was a scary time. Uh, again, I'm kind of digressing. I'm back in sure. Da Nang now. Sure. And we were going back to base, and it was nighttime. And I had an engine man. Uh, who came up and he said, Mr. Halley said, uh, we're taking on water. One of our boots is burned out. We're taking on water. And I said, well, I hope you got the pumps going. And he said, I do, but we're taking on more water than the pumps can handle. And I said, oh. So we had to get the buckets out. And I'm looking at the chart and where we are. And the nearest land is this barrier island, which is 100% Viet Cong occupied. And there was no way in the world I was going to make a, a land run. And meanwhile, this engine man, I had two main engine men while I was in Vietnam. And one of them I'll single out by name, Bob Bennett. He was not the engine man in this instance, was fantastic. We had a good relationship. He was just a, as good as they get. This particular guy, he was good, but he was, he was a nervous type guy. And I remember he came back up to the pilot house. He said, Mr. Halley, head for land. We're going down. Mm. And I said, there's no way. He said, we're going to have to, you know, we'll swim before we do that. So we began bailing out. And I remember I sent a communication. And we had two different radios. We had the PRC-77. Mm. And then we had the, and I forget the, the nomenclature of the radio, but it was a lower frequency that went out to the Seventh Fleet, the entire Seventh Fleet. And I remember I sent out a message to the Seventh Fleet that we were taking on water, hoping to make uh, make it back to base, but uh, I wanted to, them to have our position in case we had to be uh, rescued. We did make it back, so it was, the guy panicked, but uh, and it, and and I don't fault him for that. We yeah. we could have, you know, who yeah. knows how it could have ended. But it, these are the types yeah. of stressful situations that you had to deal with and and they were very stressful mm -hmm. people think of swift boats as uh, something that you know you went water skiing on but there was always something yeah. engines breaking down taking on water rough seas and went, never mind being shot at that yeah. that's and you were sitting target you, you in the, certainly in the rivers so anyway getting back ahead to antoy coastal division 11 we're, we're transiting and I remember when we were briefed at Cat Low um, about making that transit, I remember specifically told, if you miss Antoy, the island, or actually it was called Fuquak Island. Antoy, I think, was like the town or something, it was, but it still was a small island. If you miss it, you're going to be in the open seas. Mm -hmm. You are going to be in the open seas, so make damn sure you know where you are. How close were you to the shore? The land? If I had to guess, um, if I had to guess three to five miles okay. out, okay. that would be my guess. Because sometimes, uh, again, I'm so rusty, it's been almost half a century. But, you know, you had different, you know, we had charts. We'd show hazards to navigation. could be rocks. It could be, yeah. you know, it could be anything. So you want it to be far, far enough out where you weren't going to run into anything. And that, that, and that was a problem. Some guys did. Not not in this particular instance, but sometimes boats did. Um, they did run up in rocks and shoals and things. Uh, not a good thing. Yeah. So we were making a transit, and the uh, problem with the radar was that with all the, when the seas are heavy, you have all this clutter, and it's hard to distinguish sometimes. You know whether that's a vessel up there, 
or is that land, or is that clutter from the from the heavy seas? Um, so it was tense, but we did make it to Antwerp. And I remember, <laughs> still remember, uh, on the barrack ship, all these people were manning the rails because they wanted to see the new swift boats. Oh, you know, so we got there and tied up, and uh, from there, we uh, we never did get our get back after 30 days. I never saw the Ops boss again. We spent <laughs> nine months. And and at first they told us, you're going to be doing nothing but coastal patrol. And that all changed with, um, in about 30 days, we were in the rivers with everybody else. So Before we continue, I yeah. want to get a couple of details. One is the boat that is pictured on your shirt, that is a swift boat. That is a swift okay. boat. And what was the composition of the crew? You mentioned that there was a Vietnamese on in the crew. Was there always a Vietnamese? And no. What was the size of the crew? Um, we had a Vietnamese sailor on board during my time, probably 50% of the time. Okay. But the crew was one officer, five enlisted. Okay. Okay, we'll continue on. Then. Uh, well, we began doing the uh, riverine operations first at sea float. That was an operation that Admiral Zumwalt had put together, and these were floating pontoons in the river. They were anchored, and it was a base, literally a base, but it was these floating pontoons that were anchored, and it was supposed to be a temporary base, and they were building the land base called Solid Anchor while we were there. and. It, it was finished shortly after I left Vietnam, but uh, in the beginning, uh, I was, the whole time I was there, we were on the, the pontoon, it's called Sea Float. And Sea Float had other different boats. Um, I'm a little rusty on this, whether the Army had some of their boats there. They may have had their Tango boats and other nomenclature boats. Certainly the Navy, had, um, we had our Swift boats. There were uh, PBRs there. Navy SEALs operated from there, Army Special Forces operated from Sea Float, and we were there. The two main missions were, one was uh, the tugboats had to bring in barges from the Pacific Ocean uh, to bring in gravel and other material for the, the new Navy, uh, the new solid anchor base. So they were constantly going in and out with um, gravel and whatever else they needed for it to build it. You should know this, that the river, this river, was not really a river. It was like the East River in New York. It was a salt water estuary, and you came in the Pacific Ocean and then came out on the very, very southern tip of Vietnam, the Cao Mau Peninsula, which is where the Pacific Ocean and the Gulf of Thailand come together. So that's where sea flow is. The Bode River went in one and out the other. And there were brutal, brutal tide, tide changes. And I'll share one story with you about those tide changes. Um, we had inserted, myself and a, a fellow officer named Pete Wolston, uh, we inserted some special forces. Uh, as I recall, they were Army Green Beret special forces this particular night. We inserted them, and then we dropped um, we tied up uh, with grappling hooks to the beach. Uh, not really a beach, um, for sure. <laughs> Don't think of it as a beach. Yeah. It, was, it was really uh, growth, uh, a lot of growth there. So we used a grappling hook to hold us in place. And our mission was, you know, drop these guys off, whatever their mission was. I don't, I don't remember, you know, because we did this all the time. It could have been a kidnapping mission of some Viet Cong. It could have been a, uh, you know, an assault type mission, it could have been a re reconnoitering. I, I, I don't remember. Again, these were very common. <clears throat> so Pete and I, we were tied up, our boats were tied up. It was late at night and we weren't gonna pull, you know, get these guys until the next day. And we were there for gunfire support if they needed us and emergency extraction. And just out of nowhere, I remember Pete saying, oh my God, he said, um, we don't have any water under us. And, and what had happened is the tide began to go out, and it, and it went out quickly. And all of a sudden, Pete's boat is, he's mostly high and dry, and his boat was starting to, to capsize. So 
I had, I, I don't remember exactly the situation, but I had water under me, and I was able to move my boat alongside his, and we tied up, the two boats tied up together, so basically he wouldn't tip over. Mm -hmm. And we put some guys on the shore. I hate to use the word shore because it's not really yeah, shore. We yeah. put them on land. That's yeah. probably a better word. We had these uh, sensors. Um, so a lot of times if you were on some kind of night operation where you had to tie up to land, you'd put out these sensors. Uh, they were small, a little, you know, like a little radio box. And you put these sensors in the ground, and that way, if you know there were Kong or NVA or somebody out there, you know, and you were monitoring them from the boat, if there was any movement, you might hear it. So we put out these sensors, and we put out some. And I hated doing this because you know we weren't trained to be on land. You know, they could be booby traps, they could yeah, be yeah. mines, who knows? And we weren't trained for that. And you know, we had you know on my boat, some of the guys they always wanted to go on land. They wanted to be soldiers. So. And, and I just would always say no. Yeah. I mean, we're not trained for that. Yeah. Why, why would you, you know, risk somebody's life yeah. unless there was an operational reason? Well, we had one this particular night. And we put some guys out, you know, maybe 100 yards out, you know, basically formed a perimeter in case, because uh, we were sitting ducks. We couldn't move. I mean, we, we were there. till the tide came in, we weren't going anywhere. Yeah. So we got through that, and it was a big lesson for us about the uh, salt water uh, mm -hmm. Estuary and the tidal movement. It was it was scary. Um, the other, the, another really, I mean, there are too many stories you could tell, but I'll just share this one other that comes to mind. Um, we were we had inserted um, these two um, Army Green Berets and few other, there are several of them, that, but these two, and I'm going to use their race because it's part of the story. They were black guys, two, two Army Special Forces, uh, black, black men, and a couple other guys, and, and they had a mission. They were going to, we were going to insert them uh, where they, uh, they had a little boat uh, that we carried, and they were going up this canal, and they were setting up to ambush any Viet Cong that might come down. And our mission was to stay in the main river, uh, again with a grappling hook, mm -hmm. and pull them out if there was an emergency or uh, lend gunfire support if, if they needed it. it. You know, it was pretty routine stuff. It wasn't the kind of thing to get you all, <clears throat> get your blood pressure worked up. So it was late in the afternoon, it was still daylight. I bet we hadn't been. Um, sitting there for more than half an hour, an hour, you know, thinking about our dinner plans with our sea rats. <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose. We hear, you know, automatic weapons fire, grenades going off, and I'm like, whoa, what's going on here, you know? And, and it was obvious from the guys, these Green Berets. I'm trying to get them on the radio. I can't get anything. And, and then the gunfire stopped. And I'm trying desperately to get him on the radio. Do you need help? Do we need to come in? And I'm thinking, oh, this is not going to be good. And if I can't get them, yeah, what does that mean, right? Yeah. And, you know, there's no question we were going to have to go up that canal and uh, try and find him and get him out of there, dead or alive. So finally, they came puttering down in their little boat. And we pulled them up and said, what happened, man? Well, it turned out a uh, Viet Cong, uh, one or two Viet Cong sampans had come down, and uh, they killed everybody. They killed everybody in these sampans. And then um, they took whatever, you know, was of value for intelligence with yeah. them. But I get back to the fact that these were two black guys. This was 1970, early 1970. And I remember one of them said to the other, they said, you think we've earned the right to vote now in Alabama? Really? I remember he said that. I wow. remember he said that to the other guy. I said, you think we earned the right to vote in Alabama now? Wow. Gosh. That's why I said that. Yeah, it was pretty powerful yeah. that, you know, to hear that. So um, spent the good part of my time uh, there and then Hatien was a village um, on a river and uh, along the 
in the Gulf of Thailand near the Cambodian border. Spent a fair amount of time in uh, that river as well. That was a hot, hot bed uh, too. Interestingly about that particular river, um, when we were at Antoy, our base, again 40 miles out, when you got near Ha Tien, <laughs> some guys found out the hard way that they were serious. Uh, there's a term in the Navy called a range. And what a range is, you have two markers. And when you navigate, those two markers have to be perfectly in line. And you follow that, that alignment. Because the mouth of that river, it was shoal water on both sides, and it was very narrow. Very narrow to get in there safely. Yeah. So you were always looking for that range, trying to line your boat up so you could follow, um, get into the mouth of the river. I, I never had any problems with that, but you know, sometimes some people did, especially at nighttime, it yeah. could, be, could be a difficulty. But again, that's just a day-to-day -day routine type thing. That was no big deal, but you know, people who don't know what we did would have yeah. no idea that there's a lot more to it than just cranking up the engine and going out there yeah. like you're uh, yeah. you know, in a yacht of some kind, <laughs> a lot more. Well, you know, the image of a swift boat in the river is, as I said earlier, a sitting duck. And you've got land, although it's not maybe solid land on either side, and you're just going down the river. I mean, how did you handle it when you ever, did you ever get attacked from one side or the other while you're in the river and you've got the Viet Cong? And, taking fire on you? You're taking fire from them? And I, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, the first time in, when we were down, when we were at sea float, it was a nighttime operation. We were taking a tugboat back out, escorting it. You know, we, you know, we were the, um, you know, in case they came under attack, you know, that, that was our mission. So you had one boat in front, one behind. Once they got out into the Pacific Ocean, you turned around and went back. And I remember we were coming back, and it was at nighttime. And it wasn't really a firefight, but we took a B, well, we didn't get hit, but a B, uh, Viet Cong fired a B-40 rocket at us. And I remember hearing the blast, ba-boom, seeing the flash, and the guy in the gun tub and the guy back aft on the machine guns, I mean, they let loose. You know, who knows what happened. Um, but yeah, you were kind of a sitting duck, but at nighttime, it was a lot harder to see you. And, and I remember uh, when we reported it, you know, I report, you know, got on the radio and said, hey, we're taking fire uh, here. And, and that's right, we did set up for mortar. That was one of the things we were trained to do. We get past the zone, you pull in and set up for mortar and lob some uh, mortar rounds in. Uh, but that was the first nighttime uh, attack um, that had occurred from what they had told us uh, at the time. Um, uh, one of the scarier moments, you know, and again, to talk about, you know, people, people's image of a swift boat life versus reality, we weren't on the fire every day. I've heard some people talk about being on the fire all the time. Well, if that's the case, it wasn't my experience and it, and it wasn't the experience of other people that I was with during that year that they were under this daily fire. It's just yeah. not, not the case. At least, certainly, again, not during my year. Yeah. But I remember this particular operation, uh, again, down in sea float. And we had uh, two Army uh, Special Forces uh, officers and a few of their enlisted guys. And we were carrying these sandpans on our boat, and we were taking them up a canal. And this was a canal that. Uh, Boats hadn't gone up in a long time for, I think, because they were pretty dangerous. They knew that it was a heavily occupied Viet Cong further up. So the, the, the tension, the stress, you know, like, okay, we're going up this canal, you know, several miles up this canal, and, and the canal is narrower than the length of your boat. So if you're going to turn around, you have to do a K turn. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it was pretty tense. So we're going up this canal. And I was the lead boat. Um, I was a senior guy again. Again, <laughs> seniority among JGs is 
there was an old expression. I remember seniority among JGs and incidents is like uh, what virtue among women or some some <laughs> crazy thing. But yeah. But anyway, um, I was the lead boat, and all of a sudden I hear these two explosions right off of our boat. I mean, right there at the bank. And I saw the blast of one of them. And <clears throat> while we were going up that canal, I never, I never was behind the uh, helm of the boat, ever. I mean, you had a guy doing that. And my, my job was to um, make sure I knew where we were at all times. So I had a chart. It was on a table, had a plastic covering and a grease pencil. So when we're going up a river like this or a canal, you know, I'm keeping track and checking off with a grease pencil exactly where we are in case something happens. I can call for help instantly and know where we are. Yeah. So I'm keeping track of all of that, and uh, this this blast occurs. And you know, I hate to admit it, but it is what it is. I mean, I, I had the radio, the mic in my one hand and the grease pencil in the other just in case. But I, you know, I didn't know what was going to happen, maybe nothing. And I, I literally lost my voice for a couple seconds. I'm, I'm trying to get on the radio. I remember saying, you know, you know we're under attack. <laughs> yeah. And I, I couldn't get anything out. I mean, my, my yeah. vocal cords tightened up or something. Yeah. You know, it only was a few seconds, but still, it was just, you know, to show you the, the stress, the tension yeah. of... of uh, those few seconds, it was incredible. But you know, I got it out and said we came on, you know, came on attack. Done. But there was no follow-up with any uh, automatic weapons. I would have thought there would have been. Yeah. The best we could figure out was that uh, these B-40s were in launches that were in place, and somebody remotely had somehow set them off. And then you know disappeared just in case any boats ever came up. Yeah. The biggest fear, of course, was now going back out. We dropped these guys off. Mm. Now we have to come back out, and it's like, oh boy, yeah. we, we, it, it worked out. We didn't come under fire, but that was the biggest fear that uh, yeah. we could really come under attack coming out. Mm. So again, there are lots of stories. I think the overall impression I'm trying to leave you with is that the day-to-day -day stress, day-to-day -day anxiety, it's not a yacht club. Mm -hmm. You never knew what was gonna happen, ever. Every day was different, and even though things could be routine, and I'm not trying to suggest that you're always at heightened alert, but, but again, you never knew. You just didn't know. How would you think just the visibility of the swift boat where you were? There was really no concealment. No. You're would, would cause stress right there? No, there, there, there isn't. Um, but we had air support if we needed it. When we were at Ha Tien, that the place, uh, that river along the Cambodian border, we came under fire one time, and I was carrying Vietnamese uh, infantry on the boat. On the boat, so there was another boat with me, and we were carrying Vietnamese infantry. I, I don't remember what we were going to do. We were going to, you know, drop them off. It was daytime. This wasn't at night. I remember we were going to drop them off, do something. We came under fire, small arms fire, you know, automatic weapons, um, no rockets. And immediately pulled into the land and trying, and I'm trying to tell these soldiers, you know, their officer, you know, get out there, you know, trying to get them off the boat and get mm -hmm. out there and chase down whoever it is, and they wouldn't get off the boat. Mm. And then at the same time, I called for help from uh, one of the LSTs that had the uh, Sea Wolves. These were helicopter gunships. So I called for, they were anchored um, off the Gulf of Thailand. They were, they were kind of a support, as an aside, they were kind of a support for us. We could get um, you know, food from them, we could get any kind of help. I, I, I tell you, I can't say enough about how much I love the U.S. Navy and the Coast Guard when it came to helping us, you know, whatever you needed, they always they they were so can do and so willing to help, yeah. so willing to give up whatever they could to help you. Yeah. So I radioed in for um, Sea Wolves. We're under attack here. Um, request Sea Wolves. I I cannot tell you how quickly 
those helicopters, those Sea Wolves arrived. It was unbelievable. Now they they had a, an alarm system on the ship, and they had guys ready to respond 24/7. Because I was on that very LST, you know. I mean, yeah. when we go out there, tie up sometimes to get supplies, right. and they responded so quickly. I it, it was it couldn't have been more than a minute or two when the first chopper pilot radioed me and said, "Can you mark the area with smoke?" And we did. You know, we had smoke. Um, I think we. I know we had smoke grenades, and I'm trying to, oh, and we had, did we have smoke in the M79s? You might remember better than me. It's been so long. I'm, I'm rusty on that yeah, part. Yeah. We may have even had a smoke on the mortar. I just don't remember, yeah. but I remember we had smoke capability, and, you know, like red or whatever yeah. color was, you know, the appropriate. We, we marked the area, yeah. and two or three sea wolves came in, and with 2.75-inch rockets, I mean, just saturated the area with rockets and um, M60s from their, uh, yeah. you know, choppers. I mean, it was pretty impressive yeah, how they, that. but what, what was impressive is the quick response, yeah. that they were there to help. Yeah. They were there. I mean, that's a tremendous feeling when yeah. you know that you're not going to be left stranded. Yeah, it's got to be. And that, that, yeah, so uh, that's why I say I have nothing but good feelings about the, you know, these guys. During your time in Vietnam, did you have much opportunity to interact with the Vietnamese people, whether either the troops that you served with on on the swift boat or in the towns? Or yeah, I, I guess that's a relative term. How much? But the the answer is yes. And then to explain, in Da Nang, probably the most contact would be in the officers club. All of the um, people who worked there were Vietnamese, yeah. Vietnamese women. Um, so you, you, you know, and you interacted with them, of course. In, uh, in the Four Corps in Ha Tien, I remember getting a haircut <laughs> by a Vietnamese barber. I still laugh at this. You know, several of us went in to get a haircut, and I'm thinking, you know, am I going to get my throat slit? <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. you know you, thoughts run through your head. But, um, and, and I remember there was a, a, a town. Uh, Hoi An, which is uh, on the uh, banks of the river, uh, Kurai River up in Da Nang. Hoi An was a nice city, but <laughs> I've seen pictures of what it looks like today, and it's just unbelievable. It doesn't resemble back then. <laughs> Sandbags and concertina wire yeah. everywhere. Uh, but yeah, I got, you know, reacted, you know, re uh, interacted with uh, people there. You sometimes go into the restaurants, mm -hmm. get something to eat. Uh, certainly worked with some of their soldiers. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I had forgotten this incident, speaking of working with different soldiers. This was not a fun, uh, pleasant experience. Uh, we worked in Da Nang. Just, you know, you probably, well, certainly uh, Tony would know. The Marines operated out of I-Corps where we were. Mm -hmm. That's it. And we did work some with the U.S. Marines up in I-Corps yeah. along the Kodai River. This particular day, again, I don't remember why, <clears throat> but we were transporting Korean Marines, these rocks, to Hoi An. I don't remember, you know, what, you know, why. All I know is somebody, you know, we were given an order, you know, take, pick these uh, rocks up, take them to Hoi An, a few miles up the river. So there was a sergeant and probably, you know, maybe 10 or 12 of these Korean Marines. And we had on board, uh, we had searched a couple of sampans in the river. And I remember, vaguely I remember, that we took several women prisoners because they didn't have paperwork and they may have had some contraband, no weapons, but they may have had contraband. I, I, I don't remember why and it's not particularly important. All I remember is we took them on board and handcuffed them because they had done something uh, and we were going to turn them over to Navy intelligence in Hoi An. <clears throat> so we had these Korean Marines on board too. And these were young Vietnamese women. And I was in the pilot house where I, that's where I normally stayed. When we were moving, I'm in the pilot house. Except on coastal patrol, I didn't, 
you know, I, I, I was there most of the time, but not as importantly. No. So I'm up in the pilots. One of my, uh, you know, um, crew members came up to me and said, Mr. Halley, he said, uh, we got a problem. He said, um, these uh, Korean Marines, they want to rape these women. I said, well, what? He said, yeah, he said, they're eyeing them over and they're pointing and, and you know, and they're making motions and all this. I said, whoa. Mm -hmm. So I went back after and I went up to the sergeant. The, he was the senior petty officer, not petty officer, senior ranking guy, enlisted guy. There was no officer. And I'm trying to speak to him in English. I say, uh, you know, I'm pointing to say you, uh, women, you know, touch, no touch, you know. And, you know, no English, no English, no, no, no touch, no touch. And the other guys, the other enlistment, I can see they're getting angry now. They're getting angry. And the sergeant is trying to, you know, even though he didn't speak English, he, he, he understood what I was trying to say. Now he's getting confrontational. So I told my crew members, I said, um, put the weapons on them. Put them on them. And... It was it was tense. It was very tense. They 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 were determined they were going to have their way, and, and I was determined they weren't. Yeah. And we made it to Hoi An. And as soon as oh, and I told the sergeant, I said, you know, you you touch women. I said, your captain, he cock it out you, cock it out your captain, he cock it out. I kept saying that, you know, cock it out you, and. Um, so anyway, we got to Hoi An, and as soon as we got there, I uh, reported these, you know, the sergeant and his troops to, you know, the our intelligence people, and they, you know, reported wherever it went. I have no idea what happened after that, but fortunately, these women, you know, were not assaulted. And turned them over to naval intelligence, uh, the NILOs, naval intelligence liaison officers, and you know, they, who knows what uh, they were involved in. But you, know, but you did the right thing, and you've got to be proud of that, because some wouldn't have done that. I, I, it would have been impossible to let that have happened. Yeah. It's just some things you just can't do. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's not our American values. Yeah. It really isn't. I mean, even at that age, I understood that much. That's uh -huh. that's not who we are as Americans. Right. We don't do that. Uh -huh. And uh, when did you leave Vietnam? Uh, I think the date was September twenty. Yeah, September twenty third, nineteen seventy. Okay. We could take a short break. Yes. I just want to hit the bathroom real quick. Tony, we're going to take a short yeah. break. Yeah. Probably good. Uh, to illustrate again how every day was different and how a swift boat was not a yacht. We were assigned, uh, again, back up in Da Nang area. Uh, there was this barrier island, and it was 100% Viet Cong occupied. It was the same mm -hmm. one I think uh, earlier I mentioned when we were taking on water yeah. that I did not want to <laughs> go to. And we were assigned to do what's called PSYOPs. You may have done that yourself yes. in the Army. Yeah. And that is, uh, we were going to go up and down, and with a Vietnamese sailor uh, in Vietnamese, he would tell them, the U.S. Navy is now going to be patrolling this area. Uh, if we call you out, if you're a sampan or a junk and we call you out, do not resist. You know, approach the boat and follow all commands. That, that was in effect. Mm -hmm. Well, we were operating very close to the shoreline. And I would say no more than, you know, a couple hundred yards off the shoreline. And we were all wearing battle gear. You know, the flak jackets, flak pants, helmets, everything. I was sitting on the combing of the boat. The combing is that raised portion of a door. So if, it, you know, if you're going and you have to step over this, they call that the combing. I was sitting on the combing with binoculars watching the shore. And my helmsman, you know, he was trying to, you know, keep a steady course. And then we had all the guns uh, manned, uh, not only the 50 calibers, but we had a guy with an M60 machine gun and what's called a peak tank, which is all the way up forward on the boat up here. Okay. And 
this much of his body is above the deck of the boat. The rest, his feet and everything are below. And he had the M60. So everything's pointed at the shore while the Vietnamese is on a microphone uh, yelling out, you know, we're here and, and whatnot. So I'm sitting there on the combing and I'm watching the shoreline just to see if there's any kind of, you know, movement, any Viet Cong, anybody trying to come out, anybody, you know, whatever I could see. All of a sudden, the helmsman yelled out, screamed out, look out! And it, I immediately, I had no idea what was going on. I immediately jumped up and I had about two seconds, if that, to see what he was talking about. Somehow our boat had gotten inside the surf line. And here comes this massive wave that was breaking over. And I, I you know, it was a <laughs> futility at work here. I screamed that, you know, hard right, you know, to head into it. Yeah. We took that wave broadside. I had enough time, we had handles by the door. I, had enough, I grabbed the two handles, the boat starts going over, and I literally thought, this was it, it's over. Oh. The boat is, is capsizing. I'm holding these handles. To this day, I do not know how we came back up. I don't know, I can only guess. I, it's all I can do is guess, that maybe somehow, you know, water got underneath us and somehow righted us. I, I don't really know. All I know is, as the boat was going over, I could see the water coming up to my face. Mm. And I'm thinking, you know, am I going to live? Am I going to drown? Is the boat going to, you know, collapse on me? A million thoughts go through your head in a moment like this. We came back up and I immediately screamed out, head out to sea. You know, just head out. We did a head count. Everybody was on board. We lost several weapons that went overboard. The, the impact was so strong. We had a, a refrigerator on board. It actually blew the door open. We had, you know, we had a, like a dozen eggs. They were scattered all over the deck of the boat. Um, but we lost weapons. We lost, uh, but we didn't lose anybody. And that was the good news. Um, that, that was a terrifying moment, and a few years ago, I found some of my crewmen. I lost touch with them at the end. I found my engine man, a guy I told you was a really great yeah. guy. He lives in Florida. One of the very first things he asked me is, do you remember that incident? One yeah. of the very first things he yeah. asked. It's one of those things you, you just could never forget. Yeah. And, that, and had we capsized, I mean, first of all, no telling who would have drowned, including myself. Anybody who made it to shore, that was all Viet Cong occupied, you know? I, all of it. So it, it would have been a bad Jeez. situation. But I, I tell you this again, and I've said this over and over, this wasn't like a yacht. Yeah. This wasn't a day at the beach. Every day was different, and you just didn't know what, what could happen. Now, to segue into something a little bit amusing. Um, I'm back down again in Coastal Division 11, you know, down there in the Gulf of Thailand and the Pacific Ocean area. And my Commodore, uh, Lieutenant Commander Bill Martin, he called me in. I was at wherever I was, he called me into the headquarters immediately. So I go back, I had no idea what was going on, and he says, uh, he hands me a teletype. And I read this teletype, and my heart sank, and it, <laughs> as best I recall, I wish I had a copy of it, it said something like this, from Commander-in-Chief Pacific to, you know, Commander Coastal Squadron 1, Coastal Division 11, boom, boom, subject, of presidential interest. I remember those words, of presidential interest. And I'm paraphrasing here, and it goes on to say as follows. Um, Ruth Halley Gorman, the mother of Lieutenant J.G. Oliver G. Halley, um, Staten Island, New York, uh, has written to the President of the United States, Richard M. Nixon, that her son is not getting his mail 
and um, <laughs> the president has ordered an immediate inquiry to determine why he isn't getting his mail. <laughs> and uh, and I was floored because I had never complained to my mother I wasn't getting my mail. That didn't happen. I never said a word that I, I wasn't getting my mail. Nothing. I, I was getting my mail. I, it wasn't a problem. So. So I, I'm, I'm speechless and embarrassed. I mean, this thing went out to the entire Seventh Fleet, this communication oh, of presidential interest. So the Commodore was very sympathetic, and he said, well, we have to respond to this immediately. Um, what do you suggest? I said, well, Commodore, I'm getting my mail. I mean, I don't know where my mother's coming from. I, I, mean, I can't pick up a phone to call her and ask her what's going on. So... I remember we, we responded that uh, I had been in transit and had been moving around and uh, apparently the mail hadn't kept up, but uh, there was no problem. Be assured that there is no problem. Everything's fine and uh, uh, it's okay. <laughs> so when I got home, um, I have a copy somewhere in a box, I know that, of a letter from a general in the Pentagon. How that works, you know, since I'm in the Navy, but... Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. But anyway, I remember it was a general in the Pentagon who had written my mother that on behalf of the president or something like that, they were looking into uh, why I wasn't getting my mail. Wow. And that generated that teletype. Well, you know, that's impressive that they spent that much time <laughs> concerned about a, a, a <laughs> trooper in the field not getting the mail. That is true. It's impressive. <laughs> I got to say that it probably wouldn't have happened in the Soviet military or, <laughs> or the Third Reich, but that is impressive. Uh, but anyway, that's my, uh, uh, like I say, it was a very embarrassing thing to me. But and I, and I asked my mother when I got home almost a year later, I said, why did you do that? <laughs> I said, I was getting my mail. Why did you do that? And all I remember her saying is, you weren't getting your mail. <laughs> okay. You don't ar argue with mom. <laughs> no. I still remember saying that. Um, where would you like me to segue next? Because I uh, segue next. I do have, uh, you know, uh, something that is very critical to who I am and, okay. and all of that. Well, let's uh, go there. Okay. Back in the 1930s, um, my maternal grandparents had a correspondence with a woman in Australia named Esther Buck. Esther Buck was a teacher in Australia. And she communicated, or wrote letters, I should say. They, they corresponded only by mail, and we're all of the same, roughly the same age. <clears throat> you remember back then, in the 70s, I'm talking about the 60s and 70s, you had the, that paper, you bought it at the post office. I think they call it fly paper because it was so light. And you would write a letter and then you would fold it. Remember that? You would fold mm -hmm. it over yeah. and put a stamp on it. But it was so light and you'd send it by airmail because it was cheaper. Back then, if you remember, there were airmail rates yeah. versus yeah. first class, whereas today there's no distinction. Yeah. Okay, so this correspondence. My, my grandfather, my mother's father, and her mother, they were both educators, as was my mother in New York. And they had this correspondence. They got through the Parker Pen Company. It was just one of those professional things. And, and over the years, they got to know each other only by mail. They had never spoken. So when my grandfather became too sick, my mother picked up the correspondence. So we're talking probably about the late 1940s, early 1950s. So my mother be, wrote to Esther Buck, and they corresponded, you know, maybe once a month, once every couple months. And I remember Miss Buck, that's what I called her, she would send us little trinkets for Christmas, that kind of thing. But again, they never spoke. All of this was by mail all these years. So now I'm in Vietnam, and it was arranged that I would meet Miss Buck on R&R. &R. And I was lucky. I got two R&Rs. First one was in June of 1970. I went to Hong Kong. And then the second one, the Commodore was really generous about that, went to Sydney. So my mother arranged by mail for me to meet her. So I was pretty excited, too. This is a big deal. And the way it was going to work is I was going to meet her at her home. And then my mother was going to call while I was there. Now, again, we're all of the same age. These young people have no idea. 
But when you called internationally back then, mm -hmm. you had to call the overseas operator. Remember that? Mm -hmm. You called, Maybe you don't because if you never made an international call, it wasn't very common. It was expensive. Yeah. But you call the international operator and you'd say, I'd like to place this call to Sydney, Australia. And the international operator would tell you that it might be an hour, it might be two, it might be three, depending on the traffic, before they could get a line. So the plan was hopefully it would all fall into place. While I was there, my mother would be calling in. The date was September 8, 1970. And I, I've written a book, but it pertains to this business I have, this speaking business. And I have a chapter in the book called Life Changing Versus Life Shaping uh, Experiences. September 8th, 1970, changed my life forever. Forever. I don't know why I'm getting emotional, but I think about it. I told you earlier in this interview, in the beginning, that my mother and father were only children. I had no relatives. And, and on my father's side, in particular, a lot of mysteries that I never knew the answers to. My father had committed suicide on, Mar on May the 9th, 1966. I was in college. I was 20 years old. I was a junior in college at the time. And in that book that I wrote, I put in there that, you know, he just couldn't outrun the demons that had chased him from the Third Reich. Hmm. And he, as, as I said earlier, he had built up this legend. He was in this German underground movement, and they got into street fights and all of that. Well, it turned out that's all true. That part is all true. What never made sense to me as I got older was... Why would a wealthy family, because my father came from uh, a wealthy family. He was an only child. His father was a very prominent surgeon. And I didn't know until I sent you the story from New York Times. I didn't know until this year, until this year, February of this year, that he had actually been a, a physician for Kaiser Wilhelm and Tsar Nicholas of Russia. I didn't know that until this year from the New York, and Sue has seen the, the story in the New York Times, 1939, when he was killed in a car accident. So anyway, he had committed suicide four years earlier. And I'm sitting with Miss Buck, and she, she had never married. She was a woman probably in her 70s at the time. And she was so excited to see me. I mean, oh, she was just fluttering here, fluttering there. I, I'm so excited to finally meet somebody from the Halley family after all these years. This is, oh, so happy. Finally, you know, this is wonderful. And I can't wait for your mother to call, you know. I'm just so looking forward to that. And then she said as follows. She said, and I don't remember her exact words. I was too stunned, and so I'm close, but this, these are not the exact words. I just don't remember what they were. I wish I did, but I don't. She said something like this. Did your mother ever reconcile with her father for marrying outside the faith? And I looked at Miss Buck and I said, Miss Buck, I don't understand your question. My mother and father, you know, were Protestants. Um, I don't know what you mean by marrying outside the faith. And she said, no, 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 no. She said, your mother was Jewish. She married your father. But I said, my mother's not Jewish. Mm. I said, of course she is. And, and she, my head at that moment exploded. Yeah. I, you know how you get shocking news? Yeah. Whatever it is, really shocking news? Yeah. That's what happened to me. It was like that. Because I had experienced anti-Semitism growing up. I, I grew up a Methodist. I experienced a lot of anti-Semitism. I don't <coughs> kid anybody, you know, that I don't know. I look Jewish, okay? I mean, there is a stereotype, and, and I'm one of them. Okay. My head exploded. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. So she saw the look on my face, and she stopped short. She says, oh, my God, I hope I didn't say anything I shouldn't have said. And I said, no. I said, I'm glad you did. 
but she didn't say another word. Well, my mother called in, and we all had a very nice chat, didn't bring any of this up, and Miss Buck was so excited to finally talk to my mother. And I uh, left Vietnam, I think September 23rd, so it was a couple of weeks or so later, and got to San Francisco, had a little bit of an experience at the airport. Nobody spit on me or anything like that. But if you're interested, I'll tell you that later. And I out-processed uh, from uh, active duty to the reserves. It took, I think, five days. I was at uh, Treasure Island. You know, about an hour a day, you, you know, did administrative stuff, and then they yeah. cut you loose. So at the end of the week, uh, I flew from San Francisco to New York. A friend of mine picked me up, and I went to my mother's house until I could find a place to live a couple weeks later. And I'm unpacking my sea bag, and this has really been weighing on my mind. And as I'm unpacking my sea bag, I said to my mother, why didn't you tell us we were Jewish? And she said, what? Where did you get that nonsense from? Those are her words. And I said, Miss Buck told me. And my mother, very uncharacteristically, she was very polished, very educated. Very uncharacteristically, she said, Miss Buck is a liar. She didn't talk that way. I said, no. I said, Miss Buck uh, told the truth. And very uncharacteristically, my mother completely broke down. I mean, really broke down crying. And she said, please don't tell your brothers. And I said, I have to. Well, as the years went by, I would try and talk to my mother about this. She shut it down. She'd act like I wasn't even in the room. If I want to change the subject, she'd look up and talk about it. She wouldn't talk about it. Absolutely refused. So I never learned anything from my mother, nothing. And she and my father had destroyed a lot of documents. So over the years, it would take me too long to tell and it doesn't fit in with the Vietnam part of the story, so I'll just kind of synopsize it real quickly. I learned a lot on my own um, through reading books, and then when the Internet came into being, learned a little bit. And so the bottom line is this. My grandfather on my father's side was Jewish, for sure, 100%. I have the records to support mm -hmm. that. He was Jewish, and my maternal, my my paternal grandmother was a Lutheran. My father was raised a Lutheran, so in the Jewish faith, you know, the bloodline carries mm -hmm. on the mother's side, not the father's side. So even though my father was half Jewish, he's he wouldn't be recognized as Jewish by Jewish people. Okay. Um, so that that comment about did your mother ever reconcile with her father? In effect, my mother married outside the faith, yeah. even though my father was yeah. half Jewish. So, um, my, my father and his mother were estranged. I don't know why, to this day. That's a secret that'll go to the grave. Mm -hmm. I will never know the answer to that. It kills me not to know, but, but I'll never know. I do not know. Um, my father would write her letters. She lived in Queens when we lived on Staten Island. My father would write her letters, and I still see this in my mind's eye. They would come back unopened, and there would be a stamp, um, you know, this kind of stamp on the envelope, and it would be of a hand pointing this like this, and it would say, return to sender, refused, with check mark, refused. Gosh. And she died in uh, February 1959, but I never met her. And don't, to this day, I don't know why they were strange. I have no idea. Well. So that day changed my life forever. When you find out you, uh, there's more to your past and it's yeah. very different than you were brought up to believe, um, it, it, that has a profound effect. So that's a life-changing experience. Yeah. Life-shaping, yeah. without question, was my time in the Navy and certainly in Vietnam. I went over to Vietnam, I was 23 years old as an officer in charge of a swift boat. I came home, I was 24. 
And to have that kind of responsibility at that young age, mm -hmm. if that won't shape you, nothing will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I want to go back again, relate back. I should say relate back because I mentioned in the beginning I'm going to re relate back some things. When I talked about Admiral Ham when he was commander, when he was executive officer at Springfield, uh, after Vietnam, um, I spent a year trying to get into law school, but working uh, this odd job I had had when I was in high school just to mock time. I got into law school. I began in August of 1971 at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And <clears throat> Um, I went through, th went through law school knowing that my career plan was to become an FBI agent. There was never any doubt that's what I wanted to do. I had formed that plan years earlier when I knew I wasn't going to be chief of naval operations, and I figured that out in high school, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> in high school. So my career in the FBI, you have two tracks you know, the investigative side, and then you can choose to go into management. It's not like the military, you know, it's mandatory promotions here. Right? You know, people choose in the FBI if they want to go into management. And I, I had no interest in it. After having uh, the experience that I had in the Navy, particularly in Vietnam, I figured nothing could rival that. Nothing. Nothing. Not even close. And then, as, and I love the FBI. My career, I had 28 years. It was a free ticket to a show. I loved it. But uh, to be kind, uh, the best leadership I saw was in the Navy. And I kept going back to Admiral Ham. I kept going back to him, how he ran the Springfield, why it was such a good ship, why it was so efficient, why things got done, why things worked. I kept going back to him. All as years you know, went by and more years would go by, and I always went back to Admiral Ham. And so when I reached out to him in 2003, that's what I had in mind. Hmm. That's what I had in mind, that this is a man who really had a profound impact on my life, but I had no idea he would when I left the Springfield in June of 69. All I knew was I wanted to get away from him. Yeah. Had no idea. So it was interesting how the, uh, that, that uh, took hold, took hold of me. Yeah. Stayed with you the rest up till now. Right through today. I want to ask you about one thing that you had mentioned and written about a little bit. Uh, you apparently were exposed to Agent Orange and have a disability. You want to talk about that at all? Yeah. Um, I'm a health nut. I have been for most of my life. I mean, I work out every day, seven days a week, have for most of my life, at least since consistently since I was in my, uh, started my third year of law school. So that would have been in August 1973. Work out, I try and eat healthy, live a good lifestyle. Don't smoke, rarely drink. I did smoke a long time ago, but that was a long time ago. Um, in, on the weekend of May, uh, Memorial Day weekend 2005, I had this, uh, I had bronchitis, and I went to a walk-in doctor, you know, a doc in a box, and the doctor prescribed a, an antibiotic for me, okay? That was on a Saturday. On Monday, I had to fly out to California on this, uh, I have an investigative business, so I have two businesses, and I had to fly out to California on this investigative case. I brought my workout gear with me, and... Uh, but I was so busy out there. It was one of those, you know, two or three days a year I'll miss. Well, I missed when I was in California. I just didn't have time. We were going day and night. And I got back, I think, on a Wednesday evening. Thursday was my swim day. I do different things on different days. So this was a swim day at the YMCA in East Cobb. I got in the pool, and... As I got aerobic, you know, I started stroking. As I got aerobic, I had this burning sensation, not a pain, but a burn in my chest. So I was thinking it was the um, um, bronchitis had come back. That's all I could think of. So I toughed it out, finished doing my laps, 
and I felt okay afterwards, but it was an uncomfortable burn. Over the next three weeks, every time I either jogged or swam, it didn't bother me lifting weights. I don't know why, but it didn't. But when I jogged or swam, that burn would kick in, and it was starting to kick in sooner. On this particular Sunday, um, I started to jog, and the burn was so bad that I had to stop. I, I couldn't run through it. It was unbelievable. Uh, so I just walked some. So on Monday, I went to the Y, and I, it was a weightlifting morning, and again, for some reason, it didn't bother me lifting weights. But I called my doctor uh, when I got home from the Y, and I said, I, I don't know what's going on. Maybe I need an antibiotic. Uh, so I was lucky. He got me in at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And, you know, when you go in, they do your weight, they do your blood pressure, your pulse. Well, everything was wrong and nothing was right. Everything. Did an EKG on top of that, and it showed some kind of abnormalities. So he sent me for a nuclear stress test. It was done on a Wednesday. And on Friday, he called me, and he said, and this was in July. He called me, uh, that would have been July the 1st, I guess. He called me to say the only words I remember were, insufficient blood to the heart when stressed. He said, you need to see a cardiologist. Uh, you probably have a coronary blockage. And I'm like, whoa, he got my attention with that. And I'm thinking, how could that be? So the following week, I saw a uh, coroner, um, cardiologist. So I'm on a Thursday. He looked at the report from the nuclear stress test. <coughs> He said, I'm guessing you have a blockage. Can you come in tomorrow? We're going to have to do a catheter. So I came in Friday morning. He did a catheter. And he said, you have a 90% closure in the LAD artery, the lower anterior descending. That's the widowmaker artery. And I was speechless. I'm thinking, how could that happen to me? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm the Mr. Health. So anyway, he did an angioplasty and stent. And while I was at St. Joseph's Hospital, I called different people. And I, <laughs> I still remember my CPA, a woman, uh, she's since moved to Alabama, but I called her to tell her that what happened. And because this is, a, I guess, a family value station here, I can't use the expletive that she used when I told her, but it began with holy. And uh, she said, if that happened to you, then there's no hope for the rest of us. I still remember that. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, I went on with my life. That was 2005. And then uh, there were all these Agent Orange claims, and they were backed up to kingdom come. And the VA required you had to prove there was a nexus between uh, various conditions and Agent Orange. And nobody could prove it. How, how are you going to do that? It was, uh, you know, nobody could prove it. And it was General Eric Shinseki, when he was head of the VA, said, effective immediately, if you have one of these listed conditions, a lot of cancers and heart disease related, uh, if you have one of these list conditions and you can prove you're in Vietnam, it's an automatic. They didn't tell you the percentage, but it was an automatic. So I, I wasn't going to apply. I said, absolutely not. I'm not going to do that. I figured I'm healthy. That's, that's a ripoff. Well, the guy that talked me into it, probably a couple of years went by. The guy that talked me into it, a tremendous person, I hope you know his name, if you live in Cobb County, you definitely know his name. Mike Boyce? Yeah, we do. Mike Boyce and I are friends. I uh, met him probably 12 years ago. And um, Mike was the one who talked me into applying for the v uh, disability. And Mike does a lot of volunteer work with the VA. And he takes people down there. And he took me down there along with several other people, navigated us through the system. I applied. And I remember on one of the forms I had to fill out, it said, describe what exposure you may have had. And it wasn't necessary to describe it, but they wanted to know. And I got to tell you, the swift boat guys, we had heavy exposure, particularly down in, um, down in Four Core, because we washed our clothes in that river water. We bathed in that river water. And all that Agent Orange runoff from the banks where they spread it to knock the, knock the foliage down to push the potential ambushes further back. 
That was water we bathed in, washed our clothes in, probably, you know, inhaled, you know, who knows. Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, I had a fair, fair amount of it. Can I tell you that caused my coronary condition? I can't tell you that. I have no idea. Uh, that, I'll leave that up to medical science, and they don't know the answer yet. They're collecting information on Vietnam veterans who uh, have the disability. They're collecting it, and they, the, the plan is in the years to come, they'll have enough uh, information in the system that scientists can sit down and try and sort through it and figure it out. Yeah. So. I got, ended up with a 30% um, disability as a result of that. Yeah, wow. Well, there's no doubt you were exposed to it with what you were doing. Uh, absolutely, not the slightest. Now, nobody, by the way, nobody in my family has a, uh, there's no coronary oh, okay. history of heart disease in my family wow. by anybody. Oh. No cancer in my family. I mean, we pretty good DNA, I guess. Yeah. But uh, so I was the only one. Well, speaking of family, before we end, I want you to talk about your family to whatever extent you would like to, children or? I, uh, I started late in life with children. I'm married to uh, Molly Johnson Halley. She's from Charleston, South Carolina. She, uh, I met her in New York. She was an FBI agent as well, and she was chief division counsel um, for the FBI office in Atlanta for most of her career, but we met in New York, and I was just short of 41 when my oldest daughter, Caitlin, was born, just short of 42 when my second daughter, Victoria, was born. They're Irish twins. They're 12 days short of a year apart. Wow. And both she and Victoria, Caitlin and Victoria, right now, as I speak, are in that 12-day gap. They're both 29 as I speak. <laughs> uh, Caitlin will be 30 on Wednesday. <laughs> so they're both the same. And then Tyler uh, is uh, 27. Caitlin is an anesthesiologist assistant in the uh, University of Colorado Medical Center in Denver. That's a two-year postgraduate um, uh, profession, uh, loosely analogous to a physician's assistant. Victoria is a pediatric nurse at the Children's Hospital of Colorado. And Caitlin is married to a CPA. Victoria is married to a uh, an ear, nose, throat surgeon who just finished his five years of residency and is now finally working. <laughs> and, well, he was working before, but now finally, you know, really working. And then my son is in his fourth year of medical school at Emory. And as we speak, this very moment, he is in Birmingham, Alabama for his very first interview for uh, residencies. He's got a lot of interviews ahead of him, wow. and he plans to become an ear, nose, throat surgeon as well. And this is only a coincidence, and Sue knows. It's only a coincidence. It was not planned this way, but my son, Tyler, is uh, following in the footsteps of his grandfather, who was an ear, nose, throat surgeon. Oh, gosh. Um, and that's a coincidence. He didn't do it for that yeah. reason. He didn't even really know about it until yeah, recently. Well, so That's something. Well, you've got a superstar bunch of kids. They have made life easy for me. I look back and I've told them a million times. That's why I was happy to do the education. Um, yeah. Believe me, I, uh, sometimes uh, I say it's a gift to the giver to be able to give. It really is. I'd rather be on the giving end than it's a gift. And they've given me a lot, so. Well, you give, you've given them a lot, too. Uh, I, I will take what they've given me <laughs> <laughs> and be glad. And be glad. <laughs> Sue, do you or Tony have any questions? No, I think I'm good. Well, I want to give you a chance before we stop to say anything you'd like to say, any message you want to convey, or anything you'd like to say before we finish. Uh, I'd like to close with this, um, and it goes back to your very opening question when you asked what led you to go into the Navy. One of the things that my father did when we lived in Brooklyn, and I was a young boy, and I remember so vividly, on a lot of weekends, he would go into Manhattan, and he was a volunteer for Church World Service. In Church World Service, even to this day, I think, 
sponsors immigrants. And my father went down there. And you can picture this. These ships coming in from Europe with thousands of refugees coming to New York. You had organizations like Church World Service sponsored these people. People who had nowhere to go, no homes, lost families. That had a very profound effect on me. If you read the words, and I know you have, of Emma Lazarus, on the Statue of Liberty. Give me your poor, your wretched, your teeming masses, however. And my father and his family, before I was born, obviously, came into New York. I can only imagine what they thought when they saw the Statue of Liberty. So he volunteered his time to help refugees, and one of them came to live with us for several years. Sergei Shelhakov. He was a Russian. He'd been a veterinarian in, in the Russian Army and Russian cavalry. I, I don't remember whether he was captured or what happened, but either way, he ended up in a refugee camp in Europe after the war. He was on one of these ships. What I remember is as he was coming off the ship and people being processed. My father, I remember the story saying, you know, he's one of mine. He came with him and he lived with us for several years and then for health reasons he moved to Miami, but we stayed in touch and I last saw him when I was in the Navy. Uh, our ship was in Fort Lauderdale and I called him and I spent the night with him. A wonderful man, A wonderful man. He loved this country, what it gave him. He lost everything in the war, he lost his family, everything. I think of my father and all of that, and you say, how can you not give back? You know, how, how can you not do that? Th this country gave my father and his family a home when they were evicted from NAS. It was the Vietnam War, one of those wars like World War II, that, uh, you know, you're fighting to defend your country. Uh, I can't say that it was, and I won't, but, but that's not the point. The point was that military service was something that came to be expected, and people of my generation, not everybody, obviously, we had a lot of people who didn't share my view, but a lot did. You know, we, we did our time. We came back from Vietnam, and that was the one thing I forgot to bring up, like you and Tony. Um, People say, well, you know, do people spit on you or anything? No, no, I never had that. Nobody cared. When I got back, nobody cared. You were a Vietnam veteran, so what? In law school, in my class, we probably had 10 or 15 Vietnam veterans. You know, we, we would talk occasionally. We were probably, you know, we weren't all close friends, but we got along very well. We could at least, if there's anything yeah. about the war that was still going on, we could talk about it. You didn't talk yeah. about it with other people. They didn't care. It was irrelevant. It meant, it was just, they couldn't relate to it. It was only when Ronald Reagan um, dedicated the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier to the Vietnam missing, and I watched it on TV live. I don't know if you guys saw that, but it was powerful. Oh my God, that was powerful. And Ronald Reagan made it okay to be a Vietnam veteran. He was, that was the first. It was okay, then I could wear a t-shirt, you know, Vietnam veteran. I never did before that, never. I didn't talk about it. Not, I didn't talk about it because, you know, oh, I can't talk about it, I have bad memories, oh, I have PTS. No, nothing to do with that. Nobody cared. Nobody cared. So that, that was the reason. Um, I did forget, I did mention it when I was in California getting ready to come home. I was at the airport 
waiting for my plane to, to go to New York. When I went to Vietnam, uh, the only uniforms that we brought were our, um, the ones issued to us, wash khakis uh, and the jungle greens. That's it. Uh, your navy blues, your whites, all of that, that stayed home. So I was in the San Francisco airport. I, I was in a coffee shop waiting for my plane, and I was wearing wash khakis. Wash khakis are what you wear on board a ship or at a base, you know, as a working uniform. It's a working uniform, but it's not one you go out in public with. Khaki pants, khaki sh button shirt, open collar, and a combination hat or what they call a piss cutter, you know. So I had the uh, wash khakis and a combination hat, you know, the eagle. And this man, um, not much older than I was, well, yeah, he probably was, thinking back now, maybe 10 years older, who knows, 15. He was with his daughter, who was probably about 17 or 18, and he came over to me and he said, uh, you a naval officer? I said, yes, sir. He said, you're a disgrace to the Navy. Okay. He said, I was in the Navy. He said, we would never have been allowed to, you know, go out in public wearing a uniform, you know, a, a uniform like that. I said, okay. I said, well, I just got back from Vietnam. I'm heading home. I've been separated from active duty. I'm heading home. And I said, uh, these are the only uniforms we brought to Vietnam. I said, uh, we didn't have uh, Navy blues or whites or any other, you know, uniform you'd wear in public. So... And to his credit, he apologized. He did. He said, I'm sorry. I didn't know. He bought me a cup of coffee, uh -huh. and that was it. But that was the, that was the only experience I yeah. had, and that wasn't even all that bad. It was yeah. just, uh, it really wasn't. And, and that was kind of the other side. He wasn't a war protest, uh, which is fine. I had, you know, yeah. I didn't disrespect them. Um, that's what I love about America. It's room for everybody's opinion. Yep. Um, but that, yeah, that was it. So I went on with my life, and life was good. My FBI career was fantastic. It was a free ticket to a show. I traveled all over the world toward the end, uh, you know, with the FBI. And um, I, I was very lucky in my, in my life. I really was lucky. Probably I got a few lucky breaks along the way. Didn't have to, but I did. And I'm grateful for them. And I've got some plans in my head for what I'm going to do about paying it forward. So... Well, you know, people make their own luck in a lot of cases, and you've obviously made made yours. Your your father set a great example for you, and you've obviously followed up on what your father taught you about caring for others. And you served your country, and I mean, as you said, there was no doubt you were just going to go in because no that's doubt. what people did. But some people didn't, and you did, and you served it honorably. Um, you've got an incredible family, which. I'm sure they will all tell you is because, in great part, because of you, and uh, you've supported them emotionally and every other way. And I mean, you, you tell a, you tell the story so well, and you should really be proud of not just your military service, but your whole life and past, current, and, and future. I appreciate that, Joe. And I and I almost forgot in closing. You, you said at the very beginning, I think the three of you said, that there'll be a DVD. Mm -hmm. And I said, there's a reason why that's important to me. And I think you probably figured it out now. Yes. That my mother and father didn't leave a historical legacy. They yes. left nothing, mm -hmm. virtually nothing. I found a box with, which has some interesting documents, but virtually nothing. And this DVD will be part of what I hope to leave behind yeah. so that uh, I don't have any grandchildren yet, but if and when I do it, and my own kids yeah. and on down, hopefully there won't be any mysteries. They'll, they'll know things that uh, even now as I sit here that they don't know. Yeah. They don't know. They don't know hardly any of this. They know I was in Vietnam on swift boats, but they couldn't tell you anything beyond that. Well, that's a great message to in this discussion on and hopefully when your children and grandchildren see it they'll realize they ought to tell their story too down through the years and hopefully they will too. They should.
Well, thank you for being here and thank you for your service. Uh, no, thank you for having me here, your service too, and your service. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's, you guys teed it up too, so thank you, Sue. If we hadn't met, I wouldn't be here, so thank you very thank much you. to you guys too. Thank you.